So, hello everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, we'll be talking about MSM, uh, C++ 14 version of it, which has quite, <coughs> quite much better compilation times, and we'll see how, how it's done. But at first, we'll look into a UML state machine. It's like, in order to know the audience, how many of you have been using UML state machine? Or now, how to how to use UML? Everyone, I can see. <laughs> okay, that's good. So we'll go through it. So UML state machine is basically a way to describe actions within the states and the behavior according to the triggers, which actually will gain. So, for example, it was called pro uh, formally UML state chart, and therefore we have boost state chart, which was the first implementation. So, if you look, have, have anyone seen uh, s diagrams like that before? Okay, that's cool. So, that's the UML state machine. That's what we would like to have written in the code, because that's the way we design, and after that we have to write it down. So, we have a few entities here. So, initial state is a, just a circle which is covered. We have a state, which represents the state machine state. We have a transition. Transition can have a trigger, guard, and an action. So it works like that, that we have an event. We check the guard, for example, if the button was clicked, and we can have some actions. And if whole transition is actually all right, then we change the state, the current state. Another thing we can have is, is a composite, which is a sub-state machine, which is just an abstraction to extract our state machine into smaller pieces, because otherwise we would have one, a big one. So we can have a, a sub-state machine, which can have orto orthogonal regions, which is basically an idea that there are pseudo-orthogonal, which means that they run in parallel, however they are not parallel. It just, when we have an event and we have two orthogonal regions, the event will be handled by the first one and after that of the second one too. Here we can have a history. It means that whenever we will come back to the sub-state machine, we will remember the state. State can have entry actions, which means that Whenever we enter the state, the entry action will happen, as well as exit action when we leave the state. We can terminate the state machine, which means that the processing of any event afterwards will not happen after, after, after it. I don't know if, if, if that's, is that clear a bit. Okay, that's great. So, we can go a bit further. So, as I said, we have an that's the basic concept. You have event, state, transition, orthogonal regions. But we kind of covered that already. So, do we actually need a state machine? Well, it depends on our situation. We don't really need it. However, it may improve our code because it promotes better design because we can be in sync with the UML state machine diagram which was done via our designers. We can create easier to maintain code because we express it's declarative. So we express what, not how. That we will see later. And it creates easy to test code because it's quite easy to, uh, to get into the state, change stuff. We don't have to cover all the branches. So if you have a code with states which are implicit in the code via member variables, we can easily replace that with the state machine and check it separately. We don't have to cover all the branches, which is quite hard in the unit tests. So for example, when you have a state machine like that, it's a quite simple state machine which just wait for two items to be selected. So we start with the first item, there's a button click, we select the item, we wait for the second item, we swap the items, so, for example, when you have a match-free game, we select two items and we swap them. We animate, and when the animation is done, we come back. So that's the swap. When we have a 
uh, a game, a simple game. So how can we implement that? Without the state machine, could be implemented like that. So we have a handle method and we try to react on it. So whether the, we check whether the event is a click one, whether we are not animating, we have a method, select item, we add the count how many items are selected, where there are two selected, we swap them, animate them. We have an implicit state because all variables and uh, these items selected as well, member variables are always the state. So we can always refactor them into the state machine and we don't have to have these branches like checking whether we have is animating, is item selected. So that can be avoided. How? So th the principle is quite simple. When we have a state machine, we can have states which are pretty much the same as the diagram of state machine itself. So we, we are in the first item, we clicked. Th that, that's the notation which is used by DSL of MSM. So the star is the, uh, the, the initial state. Plus means that we have an event. After that, we have action like in UML. And the, the arrow point to the new state which should be, uh, which, which we would like to get to. So basically, it's the same implementation as the previous one. It's just, it's just a state machine, which looks a bit better, does it? It's well easy to follow. So, because this pattern is quite useful and quite commonly used, especially in embedded systems, we have quite a lot of libraries already. I would like to compare the version I have implemented, MSM Lite, with the, U, the Boost version. So we have Boost MSM, which has U EUML version, which looks much better than the MSM itself, and the state chart, which is the Boost library too. So overview. So obviously they were implemented in different areas. Errors. So state chart was implemented first. <coughs> um, it uses C++03 uh, as well as MSM. MSM uses MPL. All of them are boost license and li a state chart is a library. However, it can be implemented as a header only. Implementation details. So the state chart is a bit different than MSM because it uses UML version 1.5, which doesn't have a few additions. However, it's still useful. But state chart is more dynamic. It's using RTTI, exceptions, and it has memory allocation. And therefore, it's not very feasible for embedded systems. However, it's still useful. So let's compare some features. The basic features are basically in all libraries like tra transition, anonymous transition, internal transition. Local transition is an addition in the, UM, in the UML2, however, no one implemented it yet. So maybe we won't cover that much. Here we can see that the basic, basic features like guards, state entry, actions, event deferring, error handling is implemented in most of libraries. As well, uh, as well as other stuff. We have more complex stuff which is implemented in MSM because MSM is the most compliant with the UML2, which has fork, explicit exit and entry, which we won't cover on this uh, topic here because it's a bit more advanced. Also, all of them implement regions, composites and history. Non UML features, so that's, that's the stuff which is uh, specific to the libraries. So, for example, MSM implements any event flags, interrupt states. We have visitors, serialization. MSM Lite has a dispatcher, but it's not as important. However, you know, all libraries have uh, specific things. So, how we actually do that? In, uh, 
in all libraries. So let's have a very simple example. We have just two states. When the play event is triggered, we have an action start and we go to the plane. How, how we would implement that with uh, MSM? MSM is uh, used, has anyone used MSM or any boost library? Okay. So we have a lot of macros there which is obviously something I wanted to avoid. So we have a macro for an event. We have a macro for the states. We have a macro for an action, which uh, we have to pass event, FSM, source state, and target state, which is compliant with the UML. However, it's not really feasible in my opinion. We have a transition table, so that's the most important part here. We have a lot of boilerplate, but that's what we actually want. So here we have the in, the... in the boost MSM, we can have the both ways of the DSL. So we can say idle plus the play and start will move to plane, or we can say the other way around, which sometimes is useful, especially when we have a lot of actions. Then it's quite handy to have the, the state uh, near each other because then it's hard to find which states we are going to. And that's the way we define state machines. It's a lot of macros, as I said. We can declare it on the fly. We have to pass a lot of attributes, the initial state, and then we can just process the event, which will trigger the, the transition. How it's different from state chart? State chart is more dynamic in the sense that it doesn't need as many macros actually. So that's the event, action. Action is always related to the state machine and the state itself. So that's the main difference. Here in the MSM, we had all the transitions on the state machine. We didn't have to have them into, the st into states. But state chart has a different approach, so all reactions are per state. Note, we don't have global transition table when we say, you know, do the transition from one state to another. We do it by a, we, we implement that in the state, so that's the difference. So we don't have from which state we are going from because it, it's written here. And the process event is the same, which is, which is common across all the libraries. How is different in the uh, MSM Lite, which I'm proposing? Well, the event is just a plain struct or class. The state machine, we don't have any macros here. It's, it's more modern. However, it's not totally standard because these string literals are not in the C++14 yet. However, they are supported by GCC and Clang. It's not supported by uh, MVC. Uh, MSBC, but but state MSM is not supported by Visual Studio either way. So here we can see it quite easily that when we have a transition table, we would like to transit from idle when the event play occurs. Here we can use lambda expressions, which are pretty awesome. We don't have to have separate actions. We can just write them here, and we want to transit to the plane. How we process events? The same as any other. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm blocking it. <laughs> so I made some benchmarks. Uh, I used uh, O2 and strip in order to get the executable size. So when we have a simple state, simple test, with like six events, five states, 12 transitions, and million of iterations, which is not a big one. That's the result we get. So the main thing is the compilation time, which I try to improve. So obviously you can see already that MSM UML is not as fast as it could be in comparison to MSM Lite. State chart is, is reasonable. Execution time. So because MSM and MSM Lite is based on the dispatch table, which we'll look into that a bit later how it's done, they are quite fast in comparison to state chart. 
which is a bit slow and therefore it's not really reasonable to use it in the embedded systems. As well, it uses more memory. However, MSM produces a lot of big executable size and compile is slow. So that's the main thing I tried to improve. That was for Clang, that's for GCC. GCC a bit, is a bit slower, but it produces more or less the same values. You can see that state chart is a bit faster in, in GCC. It's probably due to optimizations. When we look into different states, different tests, so this one is a composite, so we have two state machines, and we, uh, one has five states, the other one has three, and transitions are 12 and four, and we try to iterate thousands of times in the first one, and after that we go to the second one, iterate thousands of times as well. So what about this one? <coughs> you can see still that MSM Lite compiles quite quick in comparison to MSM and state chart. State chart is always the slower, and the executable size in MSM UML is still quite big. And the last test I have, oh, that's for GCC. Clang and GCC seems to produce pretty much the same values. It's, it compiles a bit slower on GCC usually, and run a bit faster on GCC, depending on, on the test, actually. And that's the complex text, test. So that's the test where usually it would be used in, in the real life, I guess. So when you have 50 events, 50 states, 50 transitions, and 1 million events, uh, process events. What about this one? So you can see it's hard to use MSM in this case because it's more than a minute to just to compile it. Uh, MSM Lite compiles in half a second in comparison to one minute is quite, quite better. If it comes to execution time, MSM Lite and MSM UML seems to be quite the same. State chart is obviously much slower. It's due to polymorphism and uh, virtual tables and the way state chart is implemented. Memory usage is pretty much the same and the executable size is the biggest in the MSM. So you can see that there is a huge improvement in comparison to compilation times, especially in comparison to MSM, uh, UML. So that's for GCC. GCC seems to compile it a bit faster, but it's still, it's still a huge difference. So you can see that instead of 50 seconds, we can just wait less than a second and we can get the same results with the executable size much smaller. You can see the state chart. It's not really usable for, for embedded systems because it's just slow, but it's still, it's still popular. There are more benchmarks if you are interested. I compared here as well the MSM version 3, which is based on Metaparse, the new library in the Boost. It uses a lot of uh, tricks to, to parse the string. Uh, however, it's not even released, so I didn't compare it here. But you can find it there. It it's compiles a bit slower than, than MSM, so it's not that usable either. So what about MSM Lite? So what's the motivation? As I said, it's like MSM UML is quite uh, awesome. However, however, it has some uh, problems. It compiles slowly, uh, as you've seen. One minute, just waiting for a minute for you know for a state machine with the 50 sta 50 transitions. It's qu quite long in comparison to like half a second. The binaries are huge, and therefore it's hard to use it on the embedded systems as much as you have when you have a big uh, state machines. Error messages are just horrible. That's due to the MPL which is used there, so it's better, and macros. So if you have you know, a combination of, of macros and MPL, if you made a mistake there, good luck with finding what is happening. As I said, it's based on macros, and since it's C++03, lambdas cannot be used as actions or guards. Uh, MSM is trying to use Boost Phoenix to emulate that, however it has 
limitations. It's not that easy to use as lambdas. So let's look a bit about MSM. So at first, I actually implemented a version which was based on MSM. I just changed the front end. However, it compiles slowly still because it was used uh, it, it was using the MSM backend. So I decided to change it. It was, uh, and this year I implemented version C++ uh, in C++ 14, which you've seen it compiles much faster and it's just much better in my opinion. So it just one header, you can just get it and immediately start using it. There's no boost, no, no STL is required. There's no virtual methods, there's no exceptions. So it's quite handy for the embedded systems. However, it, do, it does work only on Clang and GCC. It doesn't work on Visual Studio yet. Uh, with Visual Studio, there are always a lot of problems to, to compile C14. So, so we are not quite there yet. So what about design? The goals? My goals was to keep the goodies of the MSM, which obviously are the DSL, as well as the design. So MSM is uh, split into backend and frontend, so we can have different frontends. So MSM has EUML and the basic frontend, when you have just a template with uh, the types. So I wanted to keep that. <coughs> I, I also wanted to have max performance, which is in the MSM because of the jump table. Low memory usage. That's also an attribute of MSM. The DSL, as I said, it would be awesome to be able to write the transition the way it's written in the in the EU, uh, UML as well uh, itself. So that would be awesome. I wanted to keep it as compliant with the UML as possible. However, I changed a few bits, which I didn't like about MSM, where you have to pass all the target state and source state, because I find it quite, quite not as uh, useful. So that's what I wanted to improve. Compilation times, I think that achieved is like 60 times faster to compile, which is, you can't complain about that. Binary size, it's around three times smaller. So it's much better too. Error messages, so since we are not using macros and we are not using MPL, error messages are much better. We also use concepts emulation to get nicer information about what is happening. And less boilerplate, so we don't have any macros there. And therefore it's just much easier to follow what is happening. And the last, but not least, thing which I wanted to improve is the fact that since we have C++14, we don't have to use uh, functional programming emulation, we can just use lambdas. So what about the architecture? So the first thing which you have to think about when you try to design the state machine is how to actually do it. In order to get the maximal performance, we would have to do a lot of stuff at compile time and just at runtime. So for example, in, in MSM, the way it's done, we, have a, we generate the jump table during the compilation time because we have all the transitions. And at runtime, we just jump accordingly to the state we are in, to the actions which should have happened. And I'll show that how it's done a bit later. Uh, but that's the way we, we get the maximal performance. So state chart is not doing that and therefore it's so slow. So the front end, front end is just responsible to provide a list of trans uh, transitions, uh, which will be provided by the DSL. So all of that will be just uh, translated into the template transition with states, guards, and actions. And this stuff might be used by the backend. So backend is just responsible to, to do the proper job. 
to, tra to make a transition and change the states accordingly to what we have in the state machine. So let's talk about user guide. So as I said, in order to, are there any questions regard to the stuff we were talking so far? Okay. So. Maybe okay. Uh, you said there's a jump table. Uh, how is the jump table? Is it just an array with uh, function pointers? Okay. So the question is about the jump table. How it's implemented? Yeah. We'll look into that actually uh, very deeply. How it's done. However, we have the transitions. We have the jump table for the all states. And we have the current state, which it doesn't end, and we jump accordingly to the jump table and the current state to the to the action and the transition which will should happen afterward. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll look into it exactly how it's done actually uh, in a sec. So we can also dec declare event on, uh, on the fly. We don't have to you know use the struct. That's handy when when we have events without any any data in it because usually events are useful to you know to have some data however if they don't we can just use a declaration like that it's not standard because we don't have these uh, uh, string literals in C++ 14 yet states that's the standard way of using a state so you have just a state and here like, we just use forward declaration in order to get the unique type for the state we can also use the same approach, which is not standard, but it's really handy, and that's the way I'll be using it. So what types of states we have? So the initial state, we use the star in order to show which state is the initial one. The state might be the sub uh, state machine too. So if we want to transit to the state machine, we just use the sta st state machine instead of the state. If you want to have a history state, there's an age letter for it. It's, I, I was trying to, li uh, to mimic the UML notation itself, and the full terminate state is just an X. We'll look into it in a sec. What is useful for? So how to implement the guard? Guards are just uh, lambda expressions. However, all the dependencies which are passed to the uh, to the guard will be passed from the from the state machine itself. Therefore, we don't have to worry about how to use them. We can just pass whatever, like int, double, event, and all of them will be resolved via the state machine, and f and they'll be passed from the constructor. We'll look into it in a sec as well how how it's done. Actions. Actions are pretty much the same as guards. The, uh, the guards have to return, obviously, the Boolean value. However, actions do not, because actions just uh, operate on some data, and they, they are not a trigger to the, uh, for the transition to happen. They just do an action. So what about transition table? So I'm using pretty much the same approach as MSM to have a DSL for the, for the state machine and the transition table. <coughs> Maybe I won't be explaining exactly what is happening. However, we can use source state plus an event. We can use guard in the brackets, slash an action, and equals the destination state. So if you are in the source state, the event is the triggered, Guard is the protection, action is the what should have happen what should happen, and after that we ended up in the destination state if the guard is actually uh, uh, true. So for example we have start like here, transition from source state to destination state on event with the guard in action. We can also have more combinations here because we we use uh, C just to have uh, <coughs> ability to compose uh, and use the operators from the C++. I'll we'll look into that in a sec as well. So that's the way we do it. I know, is that visible? Okay, so 
it's pretty much the same as the uh, save the code we actually used for uh, for the introduction. So you have a source state, which which is using these uh, string literals. We have an event. Here we use a variable template. We have a guard. We have an action and destination state. That's the lambdas. We can use the lambdas here uh, as well. We don't have to declare them separately. And if you want to transit to the terminate state, we just use X. What about orthogonal regions? The only difference is that we have two initial states. So it means that we have two stars or more stars somewhere, which means that both regions will be active. And we have the same event for both of them. Both of them will try to be activated. In this case, we don't have, for example, a game over. When the first uh, state, first region is in the destination state one, and the other one is in, the, in destination state two, and the game over will happen, both of them will end up in the terminate state. However, if we are in the region one, and the main, my event one will occur, then we'll go from the first region to destination state one, and we'll stay, we'll stay in the same state in the destination in the region 2. And the state machine? In order to declare the state machine, uh, we have to declare the class with the method configure. And after that, just create the transition table, as it's shown here. And after that, we can just use it. We use MSM state machine, this example, and we can process the events afterwards. So there is now a lot of boilerplate here. So as I said, dependencies are done a bit differently than in MSM. In MSM, there's no easy way to pass dependencies to guards and actions. States can have data, and states are passed to the actions. But that it makes quite difficult to test, as well as to inject dependencies. I took a different approach. So in order to do, to get guards and actions with proper parameters, we just use uh, the state machine constructor. And the state machine itself will pass the proper values to, to our actions and guards. So this way, we don't have to care about how guards and actions are implemented. We just say, I would like to have a double end data or whatever we want. And then the constructor will will be required uh, to get uh, the, uh, all the dependencies. And after that, the state machine will pass them to the guards and actions. Is that understand? More or less. We'll look into the light as well. Uh, we can use uh, boost the eye as well uh, for the, you know, automatically, for pass uh, the dependencies automatically. Yeah, so that's the way we've done it with the DI. So instead of creating the st example with the state machine and all the dependencies, we can just say, create me a state machine and pass all the dependencies, which I would like to have in the guards and actions. This way, we don't have to maintain the constructor. And when we change or add the guard or action, all the dependencies will be passed via DI, which will help us maintaining the code. And the process event, we had that already. It's just uh, <coughs> Another thing which I added for the MSM, which is not in the uh, boost MSM, is the fact that usually we have a lot of events which are dynamic. So we don't have uh, you know, the proper types for it, like button click or whatever. So here's an example of the SDL. So in order to integrate a state machine like MSM Lite with the SDL, we can create a dispatch table when we just pass <coughs> the first <coughs> event and the last event. And that will create a dispatch table for it. And then we will pass event type, which is the runtime, uh, <coughs> uh, runtime event. Runtime type is the value of it. That will cause, uh, call the uh, jump table and we will in the end call the process event of the state machine. 
So this way we can integrate it with any uh, dynamic event, which are quite handy because in most cases we don't have the types for all events. Usually it's from somewhere outside. How to handle an unexpected event? So in MSM Lite we just used unexpected event. Uh, so when actually unexpected event occurs, it depends on the state machine. So when we are in the state which cannot handle the event, we would like to, you know, be able to respond to that. So when we expect my event in the source state and some other event actually will be passed, then the transition won't happen and we can react and say, oh, in case of some event, when it's triggered in the source state, we can just terminate the state machine or do whatever. It's a handler, error handling for the state machine. We can also react on exceptions. It's only available when we do not compile with no exceptions, because a lot of embedded uh, projects do not use exceptions. But if you have an exception, for example, exception here, when we are in the action and we throw the exception, we can handle it as well. So this way, we can verify it. It's a bit like a switch case. So first, we verify when the runtime error happened, logic error happened, or any exception happened, and then we can react properly. It's quite difficult to do that in the MSM itself. Yeah? You handle exceptions thrown from a guard as well. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, it's the same case. So if we, f if we have a guard here and we throw exception, it's pretty much the same. The only thing it depends, which is hard from the UML perspective, is whether we sh when we have a transition here, whether we should transit or not. Because it depends when the exception happened. So in the UML2, it says that when the uh, exception happened in the guard, we stay in the state. However, whether the exception happened in the action, the transition should happen already. So we should be in the destination state. That's the way I implement that. MSM, like, uh, Boost MSM implement a policy so we can change how, how you want to react on that. What about testing? As I said, we have a visitor, so we can visit all the states and say which states are active right now. We can also verify whether we are in the state or not. That's pretty handy to verify whether, for example, we are in terminate state. So when we have an SDL, uh, when we use SDL and we have the loop for all the events, we would like to finish the loop, for example, when the state machine is in the terminate state. So in order to do so, we just say state machine is X, and that will check whether the any region is in the terminate state. We can also verify whether regions, uh, whether all regions are in the specific state. Yeah, there are additional readings. That's just, just introduction because a uh, state machine is more complex. However, uh, it's enough for us to to start using it, and we'll get into the fun stuff, how it's done, and how the quick compilation times were achieved how the jump table is done. So the first thing is the transition. Transition is the glue between frontend and backend. So that's what is produced from the frontend, and that's what is used by a backend in the end. So how it looks. So if you ever use Boost MSM version, the, the frontend, which is the, the main one, it basically looks the same. It's just pure, uh, pure, pure template for the transition. When we say transition, when you have source state, destination state, event, garden action. So in the MSM, it would be like transition, source state, destination state, guard action, and that would be a list of them. Obviously, we use front end here and the DSL in order to to make it more, more easy to use. So how does it work? So that would be the DSL we would like to have. 
However, it's not totally possible, especially with Arrow, it's really hard to achieve in C++. And therefore, in MSM Lite, we use equals for it. But besides that, it's exactly the same. Uh, we can also use, like in MSM, boost MSM, the opposite notation when destination state is first and the st source state is the second one. So how it's done? So what is the state? That's the way the front end is done. For it, it just based on the operators. So here we have equals. Equal operator, which is responsible for the uh, state equal equal state source state equals destination state. Here is the the opposite way of doing it. So destination state it's less than equal source state. The plus is responsible for the event. We can go to the guard as well to the action. Uh, obviously, it depends on, on on the DSL itself how we have a transition. We can go from the state to the action immediately. We can go through the guard, or we can go through the event. So what about event? From the event, we can go to the guard, or we can go to the action. And all of the time, the transition will be produced. So this way, we always have the list of transitions at any time, which we can operate on. So guard, as you've seen before, we would like to com compose the guard to get like operators AND, OR, and NOT. But because guards are lambda expressions, these are obviously not provided for us by default. <coughs> so in order to implement that, we have as additional helpers, which are responsible to call uh, call the guard. So, for example, when we want to implement the end, we have a base, operative base, in order to get to distinguish whether it's actually a guard, a lambda expression, or an end, which may have more than one guard. And we just call it. So, here we have a tuple of states. By the way, we are not using std tuple because std tuple is the slowest thing to compile ever. So we try to avoid it, and we use. I, I'm using our my implementation, which is just a simple tuple. However, it compiles much faster because it's not using naive uh, recursive algorithm as tuple in the STL. So how is done? So we have a call method which gets the first, second, and third guard, depending on how many guards we have. It passed the event and de depth. Depth are the dependencies which were passed from the constructor and which will be passed to the guards or action. Here we use fold, ex <coughs> uh, fold expression in order to combine them together. So obviously and require, requires to guard, to all guards to be true in order to return the true. If any is false, it will just return false. So, so how call is implemented? So uh, when the call is based on the uh, operator base, I guess, here it should be operator base. Sorry about that. Then we just call, uh, call the operator. It means, uh, it means that we'll have to, for example, end might be composed from another end or not or whatever else. So in that case, we have to just call it one by one. And the composition will just uh, finish that, for, uh, do it for us. So in another case, so that's the way we actually call the guard or the action. So when it's not, ba it's not based of operator base, so here should be operator base, we get the typed, uh, t uh, types from the lambda expression. That's a, a simplified version how, we, how it's done. So we'll just take the decal the 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 type from the operator. We then we get the type list. We can get the type list here, uh, the types which are required. And then we'll just get 
the types from, from the dependencies. So here, we have to cut the tuple into event and depth because event might be, might be required by the guard as well. And this way, we just get it. So we have a tuple from int double event, for example, and we'll just get whatever is required by the guard or action, which we know from the operator, because uh, in the collie, we had like guard with, uh, with the end or double or auto or whatever. We do the same for other operators. And after that, we, when we have the basics, we can implement the, our operators. So for example, operator not for the, we have to verify whether it's actually callable because otherwise we will change all uh, node operators to, to behave this way. We don't want that. We just want the Lambda expressions to, be, to behave like that. So we just we basically call not. So in case of end, we'll just call end and pass all the, all the, all the operators which are there. Yeah, so exactly and might be composed this way. So you verified whether the both uh, types are callable and return the bool. And, and as well, afterwards, we just return and and pass the two types. This way, we will get and, not, and, and whatever, the, com the composite, which it will be callable and will return the proper value in the end. Or it's basically the same story. It's just different operator. So example. So when we have, so let's say we have a simple guard, true and false. And then we will just combine them using the simple C++. We don't have to care and implement any, you know, our grammatic or anything like that. We just use the C++ which is provided. And that will give us a magical uh, type, which might be executed and it will get us the proper value. Yeah? So I really hope you've put those operators in a separate namespace so I can not import them if I don't want them a bit visible because they'll mess up all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, they, they are in the separate namespace. And, and the four is like when you have the configure is a method and only there you will use the using namespace in order to get them. Because otherwise if you just do it in the global scope, yeah, that, would be, that would be madness <laughs> to deal with. Yeah, right. So what about actions? For actions, we have pretty much the same situation. Action requires to not to require not to return anything, and we just use sequence. Uh, I hope I have a sequence, or maybe I don't. So sequence is basically like an end. It just do not return anything. It just call all of them one by one. So that's the way it will be done. So we have a comma operator. We have few actions, and it will produce a, a, a it will produce a type sequence with all the operators, which all the actions which should be called. So bring it all together. So we have the make transition table uh, method. Here we have a concept for the transitions because transitions obviously have to have some requirements in order to be able to, uh, to be used by the MSM. And we re just return the tuple out of them because they will be the type, types which I want. <laughs> because uh, the, uh, the front end will give us the transition source side destination side guard action and list of them. And we'll just create the tuple of, of, of those. Yeah, so that's our concept for the, uh, for the transitional. So we, we need to have all this information as well the execute method which will be called afterwards. The initial state and the history is just additional in order to verify whether we have an initial state or the history state. So when we have an example, 
we'll use the standard version of state. We can have a guard uh, and the transitions. We can have a sequence of actions. And this way, the produce type will look exactly like that. So that's the MSM version 1. That's what you've been writing there. It's quite difficult to, to maintain that, especially when we have these notations, like node, end, sequence. You have to know the order of events and actions and states in order to pass it properly. And therefore, we have a front end which is done with the DSL. But in the end, we get something like that, which will be operated by the back end. What are the limitations? So actually, I, I, I encountered some problems with, I don't know whether it's the bug in the compilers or it's just not supported. So when we have a guard, and we'll try to declare it on the fly, it won't work because it will think that this one is a, a generalized yeah, attribute. All over again. Yeah. <laughs> so, but a simple solution for that is actually to negate the predicate, <laughs> 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 and we can deal with that. Uh, I actually asked on the Clang community, but I didn't get the response yet about whether it should be like that or because DCC behaves the same way. Define a macro saying fix this bug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. So right now we'll go to the back end and the you know <coughs> uh, the main part of the uh, of the presentation is like how the jump table is actually done. So what is the goal? The goal is for the back end. Obviously, since we're using a jump table, we want to have the max performance and we want to compile quickly. That's the goals which I had in mind in our, when I was doing that. How it's done? So the first thing we have to translate front end to the back end. So back end will start the state machine and the state machine will just have the transitions. We could, in a sense, return from the front end the state machine itself. However, this way we have the separation using the tuple. So that's the way the state machine looks like. So you have the states, which is unique uh, a list of the states from the old transitions. We have events, unique list of the event dependencies. So that will be unique list of all the dependencies which are required by the guard or actions. And we have the mappings. Mappings is the main thing which improve our compilation times. It's we'll, uh, we'll see how it's done. The, ba the basic idea is that we don't do much during the process event. We, have, we do as much as possible when we declare the state machine and after that do the jump at compile time as well as runtime. That's the basic, uh, <coughs> uh, basic method which are just using process event. That's the way we put the dependencies uh, into the state machine, as it was shown before. And the only thing we actually have is the current state, but because we need the, this information at runtime. And dependencies, which are, which are used to, uh, to pass to the guard. If you want to have orthogonal, orthogonal regions, here we just have an array of a current state and the amount of the number of uh, initial states. So, details. In order to make the unique fast, which is really hard in the compilation time because uh, usually all implementations are quite slow, we use this trick. So we'll use inherit, which does, that's the basic, uh, basic concepts in order to implement the unique. So you have a type list, type, and inherit, we just have, we just inherit through the types. And that's the implementation. So the way we're actually doing it, we go through the given types, and we verify whether the, 
given time, we have to use the time because obviously int and any other uh, pod or integral type cannot be inherited and therefore we have to use the wrapper for that. And if the type is based of other types which are already in the result, then we just ignore the type, otherwise we just put in uh, into our list and we just iterate uh, through all the ty given types. Usually, uh, I would say usually the recursive templates algorithm are quite slow to compile, but as we see in a sec, as we'll see in a sec in the benchmarks, this one is quite quite quick because it's, uh, the complexity is really small, it's all, all logarithm n. Uh, is that understandable for anyone? More or less? That's good. So I compared that to the boost HANA and boost MPL. So that's the way you do it in HANA. You make a tuple, you sort it, and unique. Uh, as well as in MPL, we sort, and after that, unique for the given types. I know whether you remember MPL still. And that's the way uh, we use it for the unique T. We just have unique. We don't have to sort because that's a bit different approach. So if we're doing this with MPL, when I do things like this, I almost always do it by copying into a set and then copying back. Yeah. However, you will have set will actually use the same uh, uh, thing for you. Actually, what set does is... It, it still has to check whether the types are unique. Yes. So you'll get the same overhead. But uh, the way set is implemented is actually somewhat similar to the way your I I I don't think <laughs> I don't think so. I'm, I'm it's vaguely similar. It's it's not actually it, it's impl it's supposedly a constant time, except that it isn't because the compiler doesn't implement it in constant time. Yeah. Well, I don't know uh, exactly how MPL has said it's done. I just compared the unique uh, this way. So if you just use HANA or MPL this way, you'll get quite a slow compilation times. And with this approach, uh, you get quite a big. I didn't compare set, so I can do that and verify whether how how big overhead of uh, unique. You certainly have more overhead than yours by a fair amount. Yeah. Well, MPL is quite but, slow. But it, but I suspect it would be faster than what you're doing with MPL. Might be. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely check it out uh, because it's worth. I don't know, Hana. Actually, I don't know whether Hana has a set. Yeah. It's more like a comment than that. Uh, really, <laughs> like in the way your approach uh, scales with the, using the 128 elements, there's some. Sort of Explosion uh, with both both HANA and MPL, but yours just uh <coughs> yeah yeah because yeah it's scaling very very well uh, and that's a good point. So example how we actually use that. <coughs> so when we have uh, a guard <coughs> and we have internal types here. Uh, so how that will look like? So states will be just all the states, and we'll just unique them, and we'll get that basically with no compile time overhead events as well. It just to get the list, we'll just get through all of them with the variadic template, and just get source state and destination state combine combine them, and after that we just unique them. The same for events, and the same for uh, dependencies. So that's pretty straightforward. Is that understandable how, you, how that translates to each other? So Do you mean type list or tube list? Here is a type list, because we don't. The last one. Is that there's a tube list? Yeah, uh, is, is a uh, tuple, yeah. Uh, because the sorry, it's a type. <laughs> yeah, it's a type. It's a type. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it should be a tuple because a tuple actually requires uh, dependencies require to be stored, and 
uh, states and events, we don't store them. So we just need a type. So how the mapping is done. That's the main thing where we want to gain the performance. We want to avoid all the template magic when the process event is happening. Because process event is, uh, is happening a lot of times. And, we will ha uh, and if we will have to do a lot of compile time magic there, it, it will compile slowly. That's the way MPL is done, and therefore it compiles quite slow. The goal, the goal for mappings is to have something like that, that will have the mappings per, uh, per event and per states afterwards. So we have play is a state, per, sorry, play is event, so because we have to have the mappings per event first, because process event required the event first. And after that, we have a list of states with the transitions, because one state can have more than one transition. And the we'll have to verify whether the guards are right for the, for the, for the, for the transition for the current state. Is the idea understandable? All right? Great. So how we can do that? So that's the algorithm. Uh, I don't have here the implementation of, the, uh, of it. Uh, we'll look how it's done. However, we won't get the whole algorithm, just the, the basic steps. So we go for the, all the unique event. We find the transition for the current event. And for each transition, create a pa pair for the, for the event and the state transition. And state transition is the list of the transitions which are for the current for the state which are trying to uh, find them for and the main key is here is a pair because this way we can use a map compile time map which is another trick which will give us quick compilation times so a lot of compile time libraries these days are using the same trick in order to get the key from the map HANA used to use that, however, it's not anymore. They use hash mapping, which is not that fast. But I don't know exactly what's the reason why they changed that. So the way it works, you have a map which just inherits from the pairs. When we have the pairs uh, and the list of pairs in the type, we can look up for it this way. That's the uh, default case. So when we have a default case, the type won't be, which is not inherited by the pair will get here and will just get default. Otherwise, we'll get the pair. However, the overall resolution will uh, give us the value as well, although we ask for the key itself. This way, we can, get, we can ask for the event, as we've seen here. Oh, sorry. We can ask for the play event and get this one. And after that, we can ask for the idle and get this one. So this way, we can easily do two jumps and get the list of transitions which have to be done. Uh, is this algorithm understand, more or less? Okay. So I made a comparison as well. So in HANA, we use map. In M uh, MPL, we use map. And we can use the map, which was done this way. And that's the result. This map is scaling as well pretty, pretty well. Both HANA has more overhead. MPL is slower as well. So having these values, we can easily, easily make it compile fast. So example, so let's assume we have the state machine with all the transitions given. And the mappings, which will be produced via this algorithm, will look exactly this way. So we'll have a map, which was uh, the thing I introduced like a second ago. We have a pair from the event and the map from the another pair from the state and the list of the transitions 
which have to be checked in order to uh, to transition to happen because we have the same initial state and there are different guards here. And it's the same for the another event and the pair of the uh, states and the transitions which may occur. So that's the mappings which are pre-compiled pre in a sense in the beginning of the, uh, of the creation of the state machine. And how we use that? So when we have these mappings, we can just get the key twice. First for the event, so when we have process event, we can go, oh, give me all the, tr all the, all the pairs for the play event. And after that, we can ask, because we know the current state, we don't know, but we will generate the jump table for all current states, give me all the transitions for the, for the state. And this way, we'll just get the transitions which are for the, for the state. So we just two, two, two calls of g give me a key, which were really fast. So benchmark. So finding a transition for event and the state, when we have a lot of them, it's quite fast. We don't pay for basically anything here. So let's look at a uh, jump table, because we have all these facilities, but we cannot use it at runtime yet. So that's the part when we would like to you know, combine runtime and compile time, which was generated. So everyone knows how the jump table works? That's straightforward. We just have functions, and we try to call. When we call the value, which is not there, we'll get the segmentation. It's quite quick if it comes to com uh, runtime. It's just one jump. So it's a good approach, I guess. So idea? So idea for the state machine is the is that we generate the dispatch table per event and per all the states. And this way, we will get all transitions for state 1, for state 2, for state n. And at runtime, we have this current state, which, was, which in the beginning is initialized as the initial state. And in order to process event, we just jump it, uh, jump to it. So we have dispatch table, current state, f with the event, and that will, that will call, call the transition, if applicable. So details? So process event will look like that. As I said, we have mappings. The first, get key for, for the event. Do transition is the action which will happen uh, for the transition, so by default it's just empty, so that is like no transition, so that will handle an expected event. Out of that, we'll get all transitions for, for the state, for, for the event, sorry, which will be passed here. So we have all transitions for the event, for the event, and after that we have states, transitions, state, transitions, state, transitions. We have the list of states, which was introduced before in the state machine. And then we can just generate the transition table, uh, dispatch table for it. So we have a dispatch table, and we just get the, get the uh, from the mappings, for the state mappings, which was uh, actually the event mapping in a sense. So we have, well, my mind be state mapping. So we have state, transition, state, transition, state, transition for the event which was given, and we generate that for the all events which, which we have. This way we'll get the transition table for the state 1, state 2, state 3, state 4, and the action, the do transition, will be the list of, tra uh, the do transition will actually, that, that's the default one if you don't have it. In case we have it, it will return the do transition for the transition 1, transition 2, transition 3, which corresponds to the given event state, and all the transitions which are there. Is that understandable? More or less? So it's basically the jump table for all the states. 
That's the way boot and MSM works as well. And after that, we just, for the current state, we just do the jump. So the do transition, how does it work? So here is the empty do transition, which means that we don't have transition for the state or the event, which means that we can handle. So here, instead of that, in the MSM lightweight, we handle the unexpected events or exceptions as well. In other case, when we have a list, so we, we were able to get the event and state, uh, tra st transitions for the given state and event, and we'll just execute, execute them. Which means, <laughs> this execute is uh, from the transition. When we had the transition for the, st the state guards and actions, it, it, ha it had an execute method, and that's the method we just tried to call. We use the expression here as well, in order to get the, because we have to combine them, because we, when we have two transitions, the first one may be false, the second one might be true. And we want to return the value whether the transition actually happened or not. Because we need that for the orthog orthogonal regions. Because if the event was handled, wasn't handled, or was, we have to de react differently. So what about, so I is that actually understand how, how it's done? Or something is not clear? Okay. <laughs> so, what about update current state? So, wh when the transition will happen, if the in and the execute will be executed, we have to know how to change the current state. So, if the current state is the value at runtime, which might be different when the transition happens. So, in order to do so, we will have uh, mappings for the given types. So the way we can do that, it just will get basically get the, num the number of the offset in the type list. So we'll create a sequence with the value of the type and the number. So we'll have, for example, if we have state 1, 2, 3, we'll get a type ID type 0, state 1, 1, state 2, 2, state 3. And after that, we can just get it. It's the same trick as we used before for the map. So that's the basic case, because we, we inherited from all of them. So basic case, we'll just return uh, the default value. Otherwise, we have the type, which will get into this overload. And we have the number as well from the pair, which type ID could be a pair as well, as the map was implemented. And we just return the number. So this way, so how does it work to wrap it up? So when we have type ID in the double, that's the default value. When we ask for float, which is not there, which will give us minus one. When we ask for end, it will give us zero. When we ask for double, it will give us one. And there's no compact time overhead because it's the same, uh, the same algorithm as the map. So it's scaling quite fast, quite, quite good, sorry. So how to update? So when we have this execute method, I didn't show how actually it did work. So that's the implementation of it. So at first, we have to call the guard. So this one will call the guard as before. We had this method call, which took the types from the guard and passed them event and dependencies depending on how, what the guard required. So if the guard is true, which means the predicate is satisfied, we call the actions, all the actions, for example, sequence of the actions. And after that, we try to update the current state. So this is the current state, this is the current state from the state machine. We have the state from the state machine, which we create the type ID, as I shown just a second ago. So we'll get state one, state two, state three, and just get, get ID from the destination state. Because we have a transition here, uh, this transition actually has a bit more info, sorry about that. Uh, because that's just a method. So if you go to the, the, the type of the transition, we have store, source state, destination state, guards and actions, 
and we can verify which state is the destination state. So this way, we can update the current state to the value of the destination state. So for example, when you have three states, one, two, and three, and we are in the current state one, and we want to update to current state uh, to the state two, we just get the value of the destination state, and we update it to, to the value. Chris, you said that um, uh, if, uh, if a guard throws an exception, then the state change doesn't happen. Um, and if the uh, action throws an exception, then the state change does happen. Is that, mm. is that true? In not in this implementation. <laughs> Uh, because the, uh, that's not exactly the implementation as in the bosom or something. Sorry about this it. Is just so, a yeah. So here, uh, if it comes to that, the action should be done here, as you as you noticed. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's the way it's implemented. I just copied it, and uh, after that, I didn't care about it. Sorry. So so yeah. The in order to exceptions to be handled properly, the call action should be done after the current state was changed. So yeah, it's like if you have any questions uh, re related to that, we can discuss it right now. Oh no. Can I go back? So, do you understand that? In high levels of the way. Yeah. So that's the basic idea how it can be done. And it will give us really quick compilation times. So if you wanted uh, as well to have orthogonal regions, we will have to do that for the region, all, all, all the regions which are given. So we would have a list of current state, array of current state. So here we would have to have the number of the region we are in right now. So that would be a, another step, how to, how to add another thing. So if you are interested in MSM line, there are a lot of examples which uh, we, you can follow. And this one is, which is really useful is a uh, UML integration, so we can get the state diagram out of the transition table. I don't have an example here, but it's quite useful to, if you have a diagram, it would be great to translate it to the transition table and vice versa. We don't have the transition from the diagram to the transition table, but we can get the diagram out of the the, uh, the transition table itself. So it uses that visitor function that you had before and it creates a dot. Yeah, exactly, exactly the way it's done. I don't have an example here, but that's the way it's done. So if you have any questions, you can try it online. It's, uh, you can just click here and you can compile it online if you want to experiment how it's done. And that's basically it. So it's, it's in Boost Experimental right now. What, what's the state of it uh, as far as getting it into the regular Boost? Uh, so the question is, uh, what's the status of it getting to the boost? Mm. Uh, it is proposed. It's not in the queue of the review yet. Uh, however, I hope it will get soon. After that, uh, I have found the review manager, maybe. And, but uh, he has a lot of complaints about which features should be implemented in order to be, uh, to be ready. And then it will be probably uh, in the review queue. So. I can say it won't be really fast in the boost if you ask for that, because the process is quite slow to get anything to boost. And you have to, you know, there are a lot of complaints and a lot of requests. But yeah, that's the status of it. It's stable. I'm using it myself in the production code, so you can use it right now. It doesn't require boost, doesn't require STL, doesn't require anything. OK, are there any other questions? No, I think we can finish. Thank you.